Who can stand before the glory of God and survive? If Moses could not see the glory of God and survive, who are these shepherds? The glory of God did not appear to the priests in the temple. The glory of God did not appear to the high and mighty Herod or the politicians, but to the lowly outcast that no one else appreciated. You know, we talk a lot about the power of God, about the, the love of God and the holiness of God, which we should. But we don't talk enough about the glory of God. God's glory encompasses everything. His greatness, his power, his beauty, his love, his perfect holiness, his might, and all that is God and all that comes from God is his glory. And, and theologians would say that there, there are two types of glory. There's God's intrinsic glory, the one that is just for him alone. And then there's God's extrinsic glory, the one that he radiates out, and we see evidence everywhere. We see it in creation. We see it in us. We see it all around us. But you cannot stand his intrinsic glory. It's kind of like this. We all know how great the sun is, right? You look at the sun, but we see the lights. We feel the warmth. But do you all remember as a kid, you always try to look at the sun directly? What happened? You burned your eyes. You couldn't do it. It hurt. Why? Because it was too great for you. Your little eyes could not stand the greatness of what you were seeing. And we cannot stand that greatness. That leads us to our third question. Who can stand before the glory of God and survive? Who can behold that glory and withstand it? It's too great. 1 Timothy chapter 6, verse 15 says this. God, the blessed and only ruler, the king of kings, the Lord of lords, who alone is immortal and who lives, I love this, in unapproachable light, whom no one has seen or can see, to him be honor and might forever. Unapproachable light. You can't get near him. He's that great. We as finite beings cannot get near. That's the glory of God. Now keep those things in mind. And there are three words that we're going to use to describe the glory of God. The first word is a Hebrew word that is often used in Scripture. It's called kavud. It looks like kavod, but it's kavud. But that is described God's glory. It's what is translated glory. But that word means heaviness and weight. It means that it's like this, this, this weight that is upon you, that is so great that you just cannot stand it. It's kind of like when, when you're near the sun, you get pulled in. You just cannot help it. It overwhelms you. It's where you feel like as soon as you're in the presence that you just cannot survive. Remember in Exodus 33, Moses, the great Moses, asked God this question. It says that Moses said, now show me your glory. And the Lord said, I will cause all my goodness to pass in front of you, and I will proclaim my name, the Lord, in your presence. I will have mercy on whom I will have mercy. I will have compassion on whom I will have compassion. But he said, you cannot see my face, for no one may see me and live. Then the Lord said, there is a place near me where you may stand on a rock. When my glory passes by, I will put you in a cleft in the rock and cover you with my hand until I have passed by. Then I will remove my hand and you will see my back, but my face must not be seen. Think about how great Moses is. And God says, Moses, you can't stand this. It's too great for you. You cannot withstand it. It's too heavy. The second word is one you've probably heard many times before. It's Shekinah. And it's not in the Bible. It's a theological term. But it means that, that God's glory is so great it displaces everything else. It's kind of like when you have a room of darkness, you turn on the light and the light just disperses the darkness. 
because the darkness cannot overcome the light. But when God's glory, just a little bit of it descends, it always chases out everything else. Remember when, when the temple was dedicated and the priests did their jobs, it says that the glory of God descended on the temple and it was so heavy and so powerful and so mighty that all the priests had to leave. They had to run for their lives and get out of the temple because God had appeared. God was there and they could not stand it, so they had to leave. And the third one that we hear often is the Greek word doxa, which means that which invokes good opinion or to recognize the inherent worth of something. With this, we get the word doxology. And it means basically you do not give God glory as much as you recognize the glory that is already there. You, you do not add to God's greatness by saying, God, you're great. You are recognizing just how great God is, and that changes you. And so when you say, give God the glory, you are recognizing how worthy he is and how great he is. So I want you to tie all that together and know that when God's glory appears, it's always a big deal. It's a big deal when the glory of God appears, just a glimpse of it is overwhelming. And interesting enough, in the Old Testament, the last time we see the glory of God is in Ezekiel 10. And that is when the prophet sees the glory of God exit the temple and leave. And you don't see it again until, until you get to the New Testament and the glory of God appears to a bunch of lowly shepherds in the field watching their sheep by night. So let's look at this text together and see how powerful this is, why the glory of God appeared to them. So let's look at verse 8. And there were shepherds living out in the fields nearby, keeping watch over their flocks at night. Now, the question we often ask is, why shepherds? Now, we in our modern day, we read the Bible and we try to romanticize the shepherds. You know, we think like, oh, David was a shepherd. Jesus is our good shepherd. But the people on that day, they did not like the shepherds. The shepherds were viewed as being the bottom of the barrel. In fact, the, the Hebrew Talmud said that shepherds were not allowed to even bear witness in court because they couldn't be trusted. They were just such awful folks. They were viewed as gypsies. They came in. You didn't know where they were from. And then they left and they took things. They were not to be trusted. And because of their job, they couldn't lead their sheep, meant they could attend worship services. And people said, oh, what awful people they are. They didn't go to the temple. I one time I was in church, and I just had to say this, I thought it was kind of funny. Looking back at it now, there was this, this lady, and she said about this one guy, she said, oh, he is such, I, I, we need to pray for his salvation. I said, why? I think he's a great guy. He loves the Lord. She goes, he's never here on Sunday. And I said, he's a truck driver. He drives a truck. When you go to Walmart after church, that can of green beans, he put it there. <laughs> but in her mind, because he wasn't in the pew on Sunday morning, he was down here. And that's how people saw the shepherds. They were outcasts, looked down upon as lesser. Now remember, how privileged do you have to be to get to see what nobody else can see? The glory of God did not appear to the priests in the temple. The glory of God did not appear to the high and mighty Herod or the politicians, but to the lowly outcast that no one else appreciated. God said, I will show my glory to them. The glory of the Lord shone around them. And that should remind us that in God's standard, there is no such thing as favoritism. There is no rich, there is no poor, there is no male, female, there is no Jew, there is no Greek. God's glory appears to those whom he reveals. And should remind us that when we look at other folks, y'all, 
we're all equal in the sight of God. We are all at the foot of the cross level. No one is greater, no one is less. And that means when we go and we minister to people, we're not coming from a place up here to minister to them down here. We're coming from here to minister to them here. And God says, here's your glory. But now look what happens. He shows her glory in verse 9. An angel of the Lord appeared to them, and the glory of the Lord shone around them, and they were terrified. They were terrified. Now, now we always, if you, you see like Christmas plays, we always think of this as like that little bitty light, like ding, and like a little angel flapping his wings. You know? But no, it says it's shown all around them. Remember, Hava, that heaviness. The shepherds felt that, 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 that weight upon them. They felt that unworthiness. They felt that, that pressure on them. They were in the presence of the Almighty. And their response was that they were terrified. In fact, it's not just that they were afraid. It says in the Greek that they were phobias phobia, which means they were very afraid. They were, or I love how the King James says, they were sore afraid. <laughs> because they thought they were going to die. If Moses could not see the glory of God and survive, who are these shepherds? And there's something about us being in the presence of God. When you come in contact where God is being glorified, where God's glory is there, you automatically sense that feeling of unworthiness, of unholiness, of sinfulness. And you want to hide. Adam and Eve when they sinned against God, God came and they saw God and their first response was to hide because he said, why were you hiding? And Adam said, I was afraid. The people of Israel, when God came down the mountain, the mountain quaked, it shook, thunder and lightning, and they looked at Moses and said, Moses, we're not going up there. <laughs> you go up there. We need a mediator. We can't handle it. You go up there. The great prophet Isaiah, when he had an image of God and his train filled the temple, Isaiah saw this wonderful image, and remember what his response was? Woe to me, I am a man of unclean lips, and I live among a people of unclean lips. These shepherds felt like they were going to die. They were being judged. They were in the presence of lights and the presence of holiness and the presence of God. The glory of the Lord shone around them. But look what happens, verse 10. But the angel said to them, do not be afraid. Isn't that beautiful? You recognize how many times we've heard that phrase in the Christmas story? Do not be afraid. I bring you good news of great joy that will be for all the people. Today in the town of David, a Savior has been born to you. He is Christ the Lord. And this will be a sign to you. You will find a baby wrapped in clothes and lying in a manger. Do not be afraid. How can I not be afraid? He's God. I'm a sinner. Do not be afraid because I got great news. There's a mediator. There's a Savior. Alice Trebeg says that the angels gave three, three um, revelations about this child. First of all, his job. He's a savior. He is the one who will bridge that gap between the holiness and our sinfulness. Between the light and the dark. God and man. He would make a way for us to be reconciled. He said also he tells us his role he is the Messiah, the promised one, fulfilling all of God's promises to restore his people, but also the baby's identity. He is the Lord. Now, we just pass over that, but remember, the glory of the Lord shone around them. I can't stand it. It's so heavy. It's overwhelming. The glory of the Lord is so great, but who is in the manger? The Lord. That is why this is so crazy. <laughs> Christmas is not just this little warm, fuzzy Hallmark feeling. This is the craziest thing you can ever think of. 
the almighty God, creator of creation, Lord of lords, king of kings, in a manger as a human baby. 